when our kids come with them. So the little, the little one. Somewhere in the middle, I heard grandma. Grandma. She said, I love you. She's too cute for words. Yeah, it's a joke in the title. Yeah, exactly. You want to be close. No one's sitting there. The teacher's going to see you. No one ever wants to sit in the front. Thank you all for joining me. I really feel like the uh, giving the adult ed series every spring is really a highlight of my year. Really a pleasure to learn with the people who come in with such a desire to learn more together. I'm so excited to start. I wanted to learn in this series together about the story of Gun Aizen in, in a number of different ways from different angles. And I find that this story, this narrative within Tana, to me, like, just embodies some of the most fundamental truths of anything, of the world, of, of human existence. Um, and I really feel like if we delve into it, we can find enormous truth and enormous meaning. Um, I want to start by looking today not at some of the more detailed aspects of the story, but thinking about the story as a whole and what the, way, what the presentation of the story teaches us about some of the fundamental questions of human existence. Okay, So we're going to take a, a broad picture of the story today, a broad view, um, and then in future Shiram delve more in detail into specific aspects of the story. So the Gemara Psachim in your first source says, Tanya, shiva dvar hodem haolam. There are three things that were created before the world was even created. Seven. I'm sorry, seven things. Seven things that were created before the world was even created. The Eluhain, and these, this is what they are. Torah, Shuva, Gan Eden, Gehenim, Kisei HaKavod, Beis HaMikdash, Ushmo Mashiach. Okay? That all of these different things were, were so fundamental, these creations were so fundamental that they were created before the world itself was even created. And I find it interesting that one of the items on this list is Gan Eden because it seems somewhat counterintuitive to me at least, in the sense that Gan Eden falls off of the map so quickly at the beginning of the Torah, right? The Gan Eden is, it exists for a day in man's experience. Right? It goes to waste. Right, exactly. And it exists for a day in man's experience, and then it doesn't even continue to be an ideal to return to throughout the rest of the Torah. In fact, there's um, we don't try to go back to Gan Eden in any way. It's not like Eretz Yisrael where we constantly try to go back to it. And we don't even know if it actually still exists, right? The next source from the Emes Liyakov says, L'chor mashma de makom Gan Eden, hu kol kach metsuyan batora umedukdak mukhuvan makomo, so the Rav Kamenetsky in this source says that it seems like the place of Gan Eden is so specified in the Torah, we know exactly where it is, and so why isn't it there? When we can find all of the rivers that are mentioned, we can find exactly where it's supposed to be, and, and yet it's not there. So it's possible that when the Mabul came during the time of the flood, Gan Eden was completely destroyed. So he says, because what would even be the point of still having it, right? We can't go there anyway. Um, there's no purpose in continuing to have Gan Eden in this world, so Hashem just destroyed it with the Mabul. So I find it interesting that this is, that Gan Eden is viewed as one of the most fundamental aspects of human existence, given that it was something that seemed to have such a short purpose in the world, but this Gemara is telling us that that's actually not the case, that Gan Eden has enormous resonance and truth for our experience in this world, and that even when we don't have it as a, as a place that we can find, it continues to be an ideal. And it continues to be, we continue to believe in, in, in a spiritual Gan Eden. And it's still, it has that fundamental meaning for us in our, our existence. So I want to take together a broad view of the story to try to understand some of the significance of Gan Eden for our religious experience. Okay. One of the most striking aspects of the Gan Eden story is how totally incomprehensible it seems at first blush. Right? It's incredibly hard to understand just shot and what's happening. In fact, even the Rishonim who take a shot perspective 
and do come up with theories and with resolutions, all indicate in some ways that they also understand the limitations of their perspective. It's very hard to come up with a true shot understanding of the story. There are a lot of things that just don't seem to add up. I remember a friend of mine told me that when she was in high school, she was learning this, this uh, part of Tanakh, and her teacher asked the whole class to write different questions that they had about the story. And so they came up with various detailed questions. And as they were sharing their questions, he said to them, you don't have a problem with a talking snake, right? Like, that's not one of your questions. There seems to be so much about this story that just doesn't add up. And we're so used to it that we don't always even realize what those pieces are. So just for example, let's look at the next source, the Radak, who sets out some of the confusing aspects of this story, although we'll see many others as well. So he's focusing on the hard parts of the story of the snake. And he says, um, We have to ask about the matter of the snake speaking to the woman. So if it was a miracle that the snake talked, then why doesn't the Torah say that Hashem opened his mouth? as a miracle, as it says in the story of Bilam, that Hashem opened the mouth of the donkey. Right? So if it's a miracle, it seems like it should describe that in some way as a miracle. So it says, and if it's like what Rav Sajagon said, which is that the Nachash didn't speak, and the donkey also didn't speak, but rather a Malach spoke for them, then why was the snake punished? Right? Why was he cursed? The old Eich Yeshi Hamalach has a Isha love or Mitzvah Hakel. And also, how would a, a Malach come and convince the, the woman to um, to transgress a Mitzvah? The old Ma Inyan Lenachash Hena, the Lama Amar Vahanachash Ayarum Achar Shehulu Diber. And also, why would it? Why would the Torah describe the snake as being cunning if he didn't even do anything? If it was really just a Malach speaking? The Im Lamar Kilinasos has a Isha Bahamalach Him Tavoras Pi Hashem Machat Anachash Bazeh. And if we say that the angel was coming to test the woman to see if she would transgress what Hashem said, then what was the, how did the nachash sin? And also, why then didn't the malach come to man? Because that would have been a better test, right? The malach could have come to man who actually had received the mitzvah directly from Hashem. And if the whole point was to test them, then a better test would be to test the person who actually heard the mitzvah directly from Hashem. Okay, so he's trying to point out all of these different inconsistencies, these things that seem incredibly hard to understand, just even internally within the story of the, of the snake itself. Okay? And the, while the Radak doesn't mention this question here, the Ramban adds another one, which is, I don't remember if I put this on your sheet, did I? Yes. The Hanachash Einbo Hayom Menapesh Mizabaraz. Also, the the Ramban points out nowadays we know snakes don't talk. But im haysabo mitchila hayamatzker beklalaso shiyalam kiv. Right? If it was that Anachash used to be able to speak, then that should have been one of his klalos. That actually would have been the worst klala. The fact that he lost his ability to speak. He he haysalo klala nimretzas mikulan. That would have been the worst klala. So if it was, we saw all the reasons it doesn't make sense that it was a malach. And if it was the Nachash itself speaking, then why don't we learn either that Hashem made a miracle to make him speak or that he lost his capacity to speak, right? It's very hard to make all of this make sense. And some of the other confusing aspects of the story, which are not related to the Nachash per se, but to the, just the concept of the Chet Etzadas and the Etzadas in general, are and we'll, we'll go into this more in a future shear, are how does eating right, how does eating fruit from a tree give someone yidiyas tovara? What does that even mean? And what even is yidiyas tovara? What, what kind of knowledge is it? It's not at all clear from the pshats. What kind of knowledge was it that man and woman received from eating from that tree? There's just a lot that doesn't seem to, uh, to add up here. So we're going to address all of these different questions over the course of the series. There's a lot to be learned about it. But what I want to focus on today is why is the story presented in this way, this most fundamental introductory story to the entire Torah, why is it presented in a way that really just doesn't add up, that really is just so hard to understand? Okay, any thoughts about that before we go further? I mean, go ahead. You say now, and as we look into it, it seems so difficult to understand, but as we learned it, it did not. So. Mm -hmm. Initially, there must either the way it was explained or the way it's told 
it doesn't seem so difficult to understand. I mean, now that we look at it. Yeah. But as an introductory story, it didn't seem so strange. You mean and as like children? Right, yeah. <laughs> right, so I think that it's an interesting question about how children understand different stories. I think we often make the mistake when we're educating children of thinking that they see things the way that we do and feeling like we have to give some super rationalist explanation, whereas that's not necessarily what children even need developmentally at that stage. I think you're right, but I also think that has a lot to do with when we're children, there's a certain capacity to just believe a lot that doesn't add up. Like, nothing makes sense when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. Remember when I was a kid, I didn't understand anything in this world, and I was just used to things not making sense. So like, right. here's something else, that, you know, it's all good. Um, whereas I think that when we come with a more mature perspective, it really is very hard to make these things all add up. And we'll see the Rishon in themselves, and we're going to see a Ramban in a moment, who really recognize that aspect of the story. They don't say, yeah, there's an easy solution to this. They really recognize that there are some fundamental problems in understanding this story. Well, I was going to say that we basically are as children compared to God. Mm -hmm. And um, God is writing this in the Torah. He's writing this story that already happened before it even happened. Mm -hmm. So I always felt that the point of it is that he knows that man is going to sin. Mm -hmm. And he has to show us that as much as man doesn't want to and as much as Gan Eden is wonderful, man is going to sin. Yes. And that it's only if you, if you ultimately, ultimately, uh, adhere to his his commandments that he will in the future bring down to us that we would have a way to, back to Gan Eden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's an important point and we'll, over the course of this series, we'll also try to come up with, with a lot of different interpretations of, of some of the points that you're making and, and other additional lessons we can learn. I think it is interesting that one question that's sort of not answered in this story at all is why does man, as, you, as I think you're alluding to, that's sort of given within the context of the Torah, the Torah accepts man will sin. Mm -hmm. The question is sort of, what next, right? And how can you set things up in the best way so that man achieves the most that he can? But it's interesting. OK, yeah, go ahead. I think really, if you think about it, if you really look at the story of Gan Eden, what is that ideal that we're actually trying to strive to? I mean, it's just, it doesn't seem like ideal. So you know, like, it's, is it necessary? What? about how it's presented in the Torah makes it that we actually view it as an ideal. Mm -hmm. If we were to look at it objectively, I don't know that it's any different than the Midbar, I don't know that it's any different than Mitzrayim, the Canaan. It's just how we idealize it via the Midrashim that we've all been taught. Mm -hmm. So I think just even fundamentally, what is Gan Eden and why would we want to get, you know, Gan Eden you know, mm -hmm. like that, that state of Gan eden -ness. Right, so I think that is very true, that a fundamental aspect of the story is that here is an environment that we would imagine is perfect, and it so clearly is not perfect in terms of how man experiences it. And sort of understanding... Well, yeah, even in the Torah. Right, right? Yeah. yeah, so understanding sort of what is perfection, or what should we be striving toward, absolutely is a very fundamental part of the story. Yeah. I just wanted to say that as... That as you know, maybe a younger person learning this story, mm -hmm. you just assume that this is the way it was, that Hashem yeah. created the world, and that the Nachash had the ability to speak, that this is the way that animals mm -hmm. maybe were able to communicate with each other. Right. That, you know, why even ask this question mm -hmm. if you think that that's just the way the world was created at that time. Mm -hmm. And, um, right, you know, totally. so it never dawned on me, you know, so like, like we said before, that part of the punishment must have been that the Nachash, you know, aside from crawling on the ground, that he couldn't talk any, you know, he couldn't talk anymore. Yes. But that just, this is the way it was presented, and there's nothing unusual about exactly. it. Exactly. I think it's only when we sort of look back at it that we, um, that we, can, that we can think about it in a more mature way. Okay, so, yeah, please. Does Olam has anything to do with Gan we, we want to be in Olam yes, Abba. that's an important point. So we do, while we don't have an actual Gan Eden in this world, I think that's part of what's interesting here, is that we do still conceptualize a spiritual Gan Eden, and that according to some Rishonim is the same as, as Olam Haba. So that's also, like, it sort of adds to that question, which I think also gets back to your point of, like, why? What is it about Gan Eden that would make us idealize it in that way? So I want to go back to the question of why is it that this fundamental story is presented in this way that is so hard to understand according to Pshat, because it could have been presented a different way, obviously, right? There is a purpose to the presentation in this manner. I, 
isn't the story an answer to a question or certain questions? I'm not sure which questions. Yeah. But is the I I think it's it's at least partly intended to be an answer. Yes. So I think you're right. I think absolutely this story is meant to be an answer to several of the most fundamental questions of human existence, right? Why does man struggle? What's the relationship between the genders? Um, why is the world the way, that we, the way that we see it? What is perfection in our lives? Many of the most fundamental questions in the world. And so we'll delve into some of what those lessons are. And I also think that the way that the story is presented, this very confusing way, gives us a lens into how we start addressing those questions. Okay. So in the next source, the Red Doc says, when he's in the course of his parish where he's pointing out all of the logical difficulties in understanding this story in upshot level, he says, This whole matter is just very confusing and very mixed up. According to what's revealed. But according to like hidden understanding, according to a deeper level of understanding, it's all clear. Okay? And similarly, the Ramban says in the next source that there is an actual Gan Eden, and everything in the story really did happen, but it happened on multiple levels. There's also an inherent symbolism and sort of mis mysterious quality to the story that we have to recognize as well as an essential part of the story. So we see this Ramban, I find it actually a very beautiful and moving Ramban. He says, that there really was a Gan Eden in the world. And it had an, a real Eitzachayim and a real Eitzadas, and they had the rivers, and they separated into four tributaries. Um, and then he explains you know, what those rivers were. Um, and then skipping down to the next sentence, about Kasher Haim Ba'aret, Kain Yesh Bashamayim Dvarim Yikru Kain. Um, he says, but just like there is this in the land, there also is sort of a parallel in, in heaven. And there is a, a yesod to all of this. Um, there's like a sort of a fundamental meaning to it. And he says that he refers to um, the future, that in the future, and in the future, Hashem will sort of help us see all of the hidden places um, that are the sort of the spaces in Shamayim, the rooms in Shamayim. Um, okay. And then skipping down a little bit, there's a long parish. He says, he suggests in the next paragraph, the rivers are parallel, they represent four sort of encampments in, in heaven. And from these encampments, and the whole idea of like rulership comes from the in in the world comes from this representation, this symbolism in Shamayim. And he's and he quotes the midrash that says the Arba Rashim, the four tributaries of the rivers, refer to the four Malchios, the four different kingdoms in history um, that uh, that that we learn about in Jewish history. And he says also that the Eitz and the Eitz Hadas, there's like a parallel to them that's very hidden and, and mysterious that is true in, in heaven. Okay, so he's saying you sort of can't really just, there was an actual Gan Eden, but to really understand what Gan Eden was, you have to understand it also represents, it symbolizes something more uh, mysterious and exalted. And he says, the Ha'adam Chata, this is in the last paragraph, the pre Eitz Hadas, Hatachton the Ha'elyon. That man sinned with both the with the Eitz Hadas, both in this world and also in heaven. Like there was a there was another parallel experience that was going on. The Masel Machshava. It was in deed and in thought. And um, and he said and he says because if the tree was good for man to eat, and then why didn't Hashem let him eat from it? If Hashem is is good, which he is, right? Hashem is good. So then why would he prevent man from having something that was good for him? And then he goes on to talk about the Nachash. He says also that the, the idea that like all the different things about the Nachash that seem not to make sense. And then here's the part that I, that I find most important here. He says, kol All of these things have a double meaning. Okay? There's the revealed meaning, and there's the, the sealed inside, the hidden meaning. And so he essentially is saying here, and then he talks about how many Kurbanos are alluded to within this story. What the Ramban is basically saying here is that, like, yes, the story happened, there is a shot level, but this is a story that you can't even understand without getting that there is also, there's a kaful nature to it, there's a double nature to it. And without 
without understanding that, that double nature and the symbolism of it, that you can't even really understand the shot. Right? That's just the nature of this story. You have to be able to understand in this story that the reason it doesn't all add up in shot is because while it all happened, it also symbolized something else. And that without looking at that deeper level, sort of like the Razak said, and without looking at the, at the Nistar, you can't even really understand the Negla. Okay? One thing that's very interesting about this in, in Parshanut is that the difficult aspects of this story are such that even those Mepharshim who tend to really not like to read the Torah allegorically do include some allegory in the way they read this one story in the Torah. Okay, the Abarbanel is an example of someone who in the whole debate in Parshanut about whether you can ever read narratives in the Torah allegorically, which is a very heated debate, the Abarbanel is one of the Mepharshim who most strongly states that you really should avoid at all costs reading the Torah allegorically. He just says, you're like, just changing the Torah if you do that, and why would it be that we would have a Torah that's, that's true, and then just right in the middle there would be something that's non-literal. I mean, that doesn't make sense. You don't have books that like change genres in the middle. That's basically what he says. And so he really avoids reading allegorically. Here also, he reads Gan Eden less allegorically than other Mepharshim, but even he, um, in, the next, in the next source, says that, um, that, and, and, sorry, in the next verse, he explains how, in general, the amazingness of the Torah is that it can be true on literal and non-literal levels at the same time. They don't contradict. But we're, and we're not going to read this inside because it's very long, but the Abarbanel and Bracious Paragimel, when he's discussing the Nachash, even he resorts to saying that there are some parts of the story that are not exactly literal. He does think, you can look at the Abarbanel yourself if you want to read it inside, but basically what he says is he does think that the that Chava spoke to the Nachash and they had their conversation, but he doesn't think the Nachash actually spoke. He thinks that any time in the Torah where it says the Nachash said something to Chava, it was really her own internal dialogue, her own internal monologue. That it, whenever it says that the Nachash said something, it was Chava looking at the Nachash and assuming something based on what he was doing. So like, let's say she was talking to the Nachash and he slithered over to the fruit and started making it look like a really great fruit. So then in her mind, that was the Nachash saying, look how great this fruit is. Yeah. So the dialogue that happened. He's slithered yet. Right, okay, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> <laughs> walked over, <laughs> good, excellent. <laughs> yeah, he, when he walked over to the fruit. So the way that the Abarbanel reads it is that the story happens and that that scene happens, but the Nachash never actually spoke. Whenever it says that the Nachash was speaking, it was what Chava was interpreting based on what she saw the Nachash doing. Okay, so I, the reason that I find this interesting is it sort of drives home this point of how, how much this shot makes us search for an answer. Because even a, a Mepharish who's so committed to saying that the Torah is never non-literal, never allegorical, still in this small aspect says, okay, but I can't really come up with a way for it to be completely, completely literal. It just doesn't really add up. So I'm going to say, make it as close to literal as I can while still recognizing that there are just too many questions with an Ahash story to read it entirely literally. OK? All right. So I want to take a step back and, tr again, try to understand what to make of this confusing aspect of Pshat. So in most stories and halachic sections of the time, there's, there's an outer reality or narrative. And there's also you know, a deeper meaning, right? And those two exist together. They're very easy to read together. They can coexist, and they're each comprehensible on their own. Okay, so like the Gemara and Sanhedrin gives the famous example, the, the, sort of the description of this, where it says that mikra echad yotzei l'kama ta'amim, that every pasa can be read as many different reasons and interpretations associated with it, and there's not, but there are never multiple psukim that all teach exactly the same thing, right? So it goes, every pasa splits into many things, but there's never many things that are never many psukim that all teach the same thing, okay? And the Gemara explains, that the, that the Torah is like a hammer that like hits the rock and many sparks come out, okay? So it's almost like, I always wonder what's the hammer and what's the rock, right, in that mashal? But it sort of seems like the, the interpretation of Torah is that, is that impact, right? The impact of the hammer and the rock that many different interpretations come out of it. This is generally how we approach Torah, that there's a pshat level, there's a drash level, and they all coexist. And you could learn one without the other, and you can learn them all together and then understand it better. But, um, but they all are uh, comprehensible on their own. So to give a simple example, the Torah commands us to keep Shabbos. That's true on a practical level. 
And at the same time, we're also meant to understand the inner meaning of Shabbos. Okay, so like, for example, the next, the next source, the Meiri on Pirkei Avos, <coughs> he explains how this works. He says, V'chein sivanu liskor es yom ha-Shabbos l'kadsho, v'la-Shabbos bo mikol malacha. Right, we have Shabbos, the mitzvah of Shabbos, to rest and not do malacha. And um, this is etzem ha-mitzvah. This is like the base, the fundamental part of the mitzvah. The amnam he miskaven is luzulasa, but it's still in, it has another intention as well. Right, we're not only meant to keep the outer form of the mitzvah, we're meant to understand it in an inner level as well. Certainly this happens in all areas of, of mitzvahs, right? This idea of an outer level and inner level, they are, they are complementary to each other, but they're also each comprehensible on their own. You could just learn the halachas of Shabbos and not learn the meaning or the vice versa. It's all, it's all good. We also see the same thing when it comes to historical sections. Like, for example, the next source from Malachim Aleph tells us about this story, tells us about different kings, say from Malachim, <laughs> and has many sections like this. And it will tell us that, you know, something bad happened to B'nai Yisrael, and it will tell us that's really because the king was bad, or something good happened, that's because the king was good. And we understand that those two, the reality, the sort of sociological reality, the geopolitical reality of the time was what it was. And that on a spiritual level, it was connected to the morality of the king and the morality of the people. But you could also just learn the history of the time and not understand the spiritual meaning behind it all, or the spiritual meaning and not understand you know, the geopolitical reality. And, and it's all, again, it can all coexist. There are double levels of meaning that can be separated from each other. So one classic example of this, and I think really one of the most beautiful examples in the entire Torah, is the story of Muhammad Amal. Okay, in the next source, we, the story of Milchemet Amalek. Yeah, and if you look in the next source, Vayavo Amalek Vilachin in Yisrael Berefizim. So there's an incredible idea about this section that Rav Amnon Bazak taught, which I think helps us understand this idea of, of different levels of meaning. So the story of Amalek appears here. Amalek comes and they fight with Yisrael. And so Moshe says to Yehoshua, go choose men for us and fight against Amalek tomorrow. And Moshe is going to stand on the mountain. And then, as we know, the battle takes place. Moshe is on the mountain. He lifts his hands up. And whenever he lifts his hands up, they win. And whenever he puts his hands down, they lose. And then ultimately, they win, right? So what Rav Amnon Bazak pointed out, I really think this is like an incredibly meaningful message for life, is that you can div divide the psukim into those psukim that describe what happens on the mountaintop and those psukim or parts of psukim that describe what happens on the battlefield, right? So I underlined for you here the parts of the psukim that took place on the battlefield, okay? If you look through it, you'll see these are basically describing the physical battle, and the psukim that describe what was going on in the mountaintop with Moshe and his arms are not underlined, and they're woven together. And here's what Rav Badak points out. He points out that it, if you read the psukim that are just about the battlefield by their own by themselves and take out the intertwined parts about the mountaintop, it makes sense as a story. Okay, let's read it together. Vayavo Amalek v'ilachim im Yisrael b'Rufizim. Amalek came and fought with Yisrael in Rufizim. Vayomer Moshe al Yehoshua b'har lanu anashim atzehi lachim ba'Amalek machar. Moshe said to Yehoshua, go choose for us men and go fight with Amalek tomorrow. V'yas Yehoshua kasher di amar lo Moshe al yilachim ba'Amalek. And Yehoshua did what, what, Hashem, what Moshe said, to fight with Amalek. V'gavar Yisrael, v'gavar Amalek. And sometimes Israel was winning, and sometimes Amalek was winning. And ultimately, ultimately, Yehoshua and B'nai Yisrael won. It all makes sense by itself, right? It's an incredible thing, this idea that a person can look at this world and just look at the surface of what's happening, and it will make sense. You can come up with a way for it to make sense. You can sort of choose to ignore the spiritual part of what's going on even though we know from reading the whole story that you would really be missing something important if you did that, because really the reason they won was because of this spiritual battle that was going on in the mountaintop. But it is possible to look at this world that way. Right? It is a choice to, to look sort of underneath the surface and see the spiritual meaning, the spiritual reality of our existences. Now, what Rav Bazak also points out that's interesting is you can't do the same thing with the other psukim. Right? It's, you can't you can't read just the psukim about the mountains happen, have it make sense. It just doesn't make sense. You can see if you look at the psukim, they don't, they don't flow, they don't follow. It's not a comprehensible narrative. So he says that we sort of learn from this a fundamental idea that in all of the challenges and the realities and the battles that we take part in in this world, there is to get the whole picture, we sort of have to think about a spiritual meaning and a reality that's below the surface. 
But it is also possible to ignore that and still feel that the world makes sense. Right? It's an active choice to look at both aspects of human experience. So if we return to Gan Eden, if we return to Gan Eden, here's what I think is amazing. Gan Eden is the one exception to this rule. Right? We saw that in the some of the mitzvot and narratives, there are sort of two levels that that Carl that coexist at the same time. There are two different aspects, right? We saw in the story of Muhammad Amalek that you can choose to even just look at the battlefield and you can see that it makes sense. Gan Eden is the only story in Tanakh that you cannot read on a shot level without the spiritual level. It just doesn't make sense. It's so deeply intertwined. In fact, that spiritual level, that meaning beneath the surface, that idea of the Gan Eden Ha'elyon is so intrinsic that like you can't even come up with a narrative. The Rishonim said themselves, you can't come up with a narrative that makes sense without looking at, at the spiritual meaning beneath the surface. Okay, And I think that the fact that the Torah chooses to start with that story and that that story is one of the most fundamental ones in the Torah, right? That story is the one that's meant, as we said, to answer those most fundamental questions of human existence. Why does man struggle? What's the nature of man? What's the nature of the relationship between man and woman? The fact that that fundamental story is told in this way that forces you to sort of think about a more um, spiritual reality, right? A reality that's hidden, that's mysterious. It's meant to tell us something about all of our searches for, for answers to life's most meaningful questions and all of our interpretation of the Torah, which is that you actually can't answer these questions based just on reason or just on experience in the day to day. You just can't. That when you're looking for answers to those questions, it doesn't work to approach it just through the lens of reason. And that I think also starting the Torah with that story, it's meant to give us a message for the rest of it that even in those stories where it looks like, or even in those experiences in life, where it looks like you could just understand it based on um, shot, based on reason, based on logic, you're actually really missing something if you don't look at the whole picture. And I think that that is one of the most fundamental messages of the reason that Gan Eden is told in this way. It didn't have to be told this way, right? It could have been told in a way that we would have understood it a little better. But I think the fact that Hashem chose to start the Torah and write one of the most fundamental stories about our biggest questions in life in this manner tells us something on a, on a meta level and in addition to the more detailed level, which is that here's the lens in which to, with, through which to try to answer these questions, not, just, not only through reason, but through trying to also understand that there's a level beneath that. Okay? I want to look together with at the next source. This is from a really amazing article by Rabbi Carmi, who wrote this in an essay that was, that was phrased as a letter, it was constructed as a letter to a student that he had who was really struggling with questions of faith. Um, so maybe we'll read this together. Would you rather read it as a group or take a minute to read it on your own with a person next to you? Ooh, group? Okay. So, okay, does someone want to volunteer to read? Go for it. Without God, the question returns, why grant authority to one neurological component to one human impulse over another? Calculation, logical reasoning, intuition, emotion, these are all psych physiological processes. Why is one of them more truth-making than the others? Medieval philosophers preferred some kinds of sense perception to others. They held that sight and, to a lesser extent, hearing are nobler than the other senses. Touch and smell were regarded as undignified. This attitude reflected medieval philosophical prejudices. If our goal is to gain knowledge of the world, each of the senses has its proper function and its inherent infirmities. Sight, for example, provides us with information about distant objects. Touch does not. At the same time, touch and smell are useful in the dark, where sight is useless. Sight and touch are spatially objective. They define space and time intersubjectively. Sensations of hear and propiaception, what's that? Propiaception, <laughs> by contrast, are private. Nonetheless, and despite the vulnerability of our judgment to a variety of mistakes and illusions, we do not scorn any mode of perception. We are grateful for whatever we have. One crucial question, perhaps the most momentous, would be whether religious truth is impersonal, more like mathematics or economic optimization, where you start from what is given, axioms in mathematics, human desires in economics, and figure out the consequences, or whether it is more like the truths of personal relationship, which remain invisible 
in the absence of active participation. In the former case, one would be more inclined to trust the methods of impersonal cognition. In the latter, one would be very wary of any approach that suppressed the logic of the heart. To sum up my argument from evolutionary thinking, I insist that the default position of a thinker who is not committed dogmatically to the superiority of one specific cognitive capacity must be a tentative commitment to the entire system of cognitive competencies. In light of these considerations, I hope you will be able to understand why people who think like me do not disdain any potential source of wisdom. The ultimate questions I submit are best approached employing all of our capacities. Okay. I think I always find this an incredibly important point. I often bring up in, um, in learning with students about how we, we tend to prefer some ways of thinking and some ways of learning over mm -hmm. others. And to think, for example, that if we can't prove something through reason, then it's sort of a lesser truth and something that we can't feel as strongly committed to. And I think the idea here that sort of pointing out that in all of the most important decisions in life, there's a range of ways in which we learn. There's a range of ways in which we know. And trying to make decisions or come to conclusions based only on one of those ways of knowing would really limit us. And we can all think of examples in our personal lives, in our professional, intellectual lives, where different ways of thinking and different ways of knowing play important parts, and ignoring one would really be a mistake. And so I think that if we, that's certainly you know, true of religious life. And it seems to me that if we apply this back to the Gan Eden story, it's really what's really telling us is opening the Torah with this, this story that makes it so clear the value of integrating different ways of thinking and different ways of looking at the world and not trying to separate and sort of understand planes on their own, but really seeing these different ways of perceiving the world as interconnected and that any one of them is incomplete without the other. And so that as we start answering these fundamental questions of human existence, the Torah is, is first, by the way it tells the story, before we even get into the details, trying to orient us toward a way of thinking that embraces all of the different ways that we, that we learn and that we experience this world. And, and I think that really sets the stage for delving into the, the questions that the Gan Eden story comes to answer. What do you think of that? Any thoughts, questions about that? Does that make sense to you? <laughs> That's a lot, right? What do you think? Okay. <laughs> That's how it seems to me. I find that a, you know, it's an interesting um, way of beginning the Torah in this way that really makes clear all of the different levels of human experience and how important it is to be cognizant of all of them. So in future shiurim, we'll delve into these different aspects of the story, understanding what the sin was, actually, according to Pshat, understanding what Yediyat Tovara was, according to Pshat, and different interpretations of that, um, which are very, very rich and interesting, and also delving into the different lessons that we're meant to take about these fundamental questions, um, having oriented ourselves toward the idea of approaching this from multiple ways and with multiple ways of knowing, um, then we'll, we'll look into each of the different aspects of the story and try to both understand them on their own and also understand what lessons they, they give us for our experiences. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I just had a thought that mm -hmm. Gan Eden is not the very first story. The very first story is obviously Breshis. Mm -hmm. and But there are two versions of Breshis, as Rev Soloveitchik mm -hmm. goes into, one and two. And in one, I believe we are given the scientific out line, you know, the, the architecture of the world and mm -hmm. seven days and creation of man. And then Breshi 2 goes into man, right? Mm -hmm. Talks about the personal lies that, and the, and the Ganadian story comes in, in mm -hmm. Breshi 2, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So perhaps this, what you're saying is that it's, this, this was the introduction, God's introduction to us that there is, you know, the science, the actual, the real world. And, mm -hmm. and then once you're in the real world, you, you have to transition into, so what happens with this mm -hmm. complicated man? Mm -hmm. Before this complicated man, there was a sun, a moon, stars, and animals, right? Mm -hmm. A fish. And afterwards, as soon as man comes into the picture, you have two levels. Yes. And Gan Eden is symbolic of these two, exactly. two levels. Exactly. Right. I think that's exactly right. And I think the sense in which, you're right, this isn't the first story in the Torah. It's the first story of human experience in the Torah. Right? That's human really experience. what you're saying, right? It's the right. first story of human experience in the Torah. So I think you're absolutely right. The, the Torah starts with that more, like, you know, scientific, clear-cut description of the world. 
and then introduces man in a complex way. And then this first story of human experience is all about those different levels of understanding our world and relating to our world and seeing the necessity of integrating them, right, as we try to understand the meaning of the story. But it's sad that it ends in a sin. It ha you know, in other words, the, the guy and believe in original sin and you never come up from it. it. The point is that man is still good at when he's exiled from mm -hmm. Gan Eden. Yeah, so one of the, I think, the most important parts of the story, and actually maybe we'll learn about this next time, is the many ways in which we actually see redemption in this story. We think of it as a story that ends just the, with finality, with just sin and punishment and klala, and it's all bad. And I think actually this story, if we interpret it um, you know, thoughtfully, we'll see has some of the most powerful messages of redemption in, in the whole Torah. Maybe we'll, I was going to do that in a couple of lessons, maybe we'll do it next time instead. I think that's actually really fundamental, um, that, that we don't have to view it through that lens. And I think if we read it deeply, we'll see that it's actually, I don't think that's the message of the story. I think it really is about man's capacity for redemption, both Adam's own redemption. We'll see some really fascinating Rishonim about ways in which maybe Adam even himself was, was forgiven, and, so, and also how that has um, consequences for future redemption. Okay. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.